apologies for my voice. It's uh, it's a good thanks to Glasgow last night. <laughs> uh, I was going to do a rendition of a, a status quo song for you as well. But it's an interesting place to be uh, talking here in front of you all because the fact that you're here is in fact uh, evidence of what we actually think about public archaeology, community archaeology. We are all, I hope, archaeologists, professionals here, but we often talk about public archaeology as if it's something different. I normally never read from a script. I strike about the place and talk. For once, I'm actually going to try and hold to a script, which will actually then hold me to about 12 to 15 minutes, because I want as much discussion and honest discussion as you can possibly squeeze out uh, as long as Doug's not filming it. Do we have a paper, by the way? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> What's interesting is, in fact, as soon as I put this first slide up, it's so condescending. It's all about fitting them into, I can't say this thing, <laughs> into the, <laughs> the round hole that is our profession. It's all about us and them. So I'm actually starting from an incredibly condescending point of view. And this is where I'm going to start with. I'm actually going to be challenging you to understand that how we treat them is actually quite condescending. But how we, as a whole, can actually work together for a research agenda. Now this is the fabulous traditional view of public archaeology. A chaotic trench. Where there's children, there's um, my wife as well, um, messing around. Throwing soil everywhere, there's um, stones going everywhere, there's fines on the edge. It's a, a complete mess. It's messy archaeology. Or is it? It's perceived, you see, to be, I don't know, archaeology itself is perceived to be a sort of discipline that, that straddles this, this mess between being incredibly academic and being incredibly messy. It's, it's got no genuine parameters. But that is our view of public archaeology. A mess. This is in fact a fabulous 16th century townhouse. You wouldn't believe it. But by the time we'd finished on that site, we had beautiful plans, beautiful sections, beautiful finest drawings, we had um, drawings, um, section drawings and elevations. We actually now be able to move on. We're doing geophysics in the whole area. We've actually found a piece of lost medieval hand that nobody knew about before. Messy archaeology actually adds to the research agenda for the area. It's a traditional view that we have to actually start stepping away from that somehow public archaeology is lesser than this. Because of course, commercial archaeology it isn't hurt by bias, is it? It's like, you know, public archaeology is all about, you know, people going, oh, we'd like to dig this site. You go, well, that doesn't fit into an agenda. You're just digging what you can dig. Commercial archaeology doesn't do that, does it? It, it um, oh, wait a second. It digs. <laughs> and hopefully nobody recognizes that sign. Good. Commercial archaeology is based upon that same bias. It digs where somebody's going to build a house or somebody's going to put a supermarket. There is the same research bias within commercial archaeology. Academics, of course, have a luxury. They can take the lingerie, they can actually then create a fabulous research agenda, spend the next 20 to 25 years um, selecting sites, seeking long-term funding, um, and perhaps getting a, a couple of uh, PhD students to, to work for them, work with them, create that fabulous seminal work that nobody else reads, and cost £30 pounds so no one else can buy. They don't have to fit into any research agenda because they create their own fabulous world in which they live. So we find ourselves here in a fabulous bickering, squabbling battlefield. We're very, very combative. We have a three-way argument between the community saying, we would like to dig this, between the commercial professionals saying, you don't know how to dig this, and the academics going, I don't know why you're digging this. Can a research agenda fit into public archaeology? I would turn it the other way around. Can the research agenda fit into public archaeology? The answer for me is, you know, yes. We can if we move forward uh, to 
to a single goal. We all do have a single goal. We have too many narrow parameters. All knowledge is good knowledge if, and this is where we get to the point of this, if it is collected in a meaningful way. I wouldn't name names, fortunately, because we are filming. But somebody said to me once that um, there's no point on, for the, uh, the community group that I was working with to work on this. It wasn't threatened and it wasn't going to add any information to the public record. I hasten to disagree with that because it did. It gave the community a purpose. It gave the community a piece of history that they didn't have before. It gave the community something to be proud of. But how do you actually deal with this in the real world as a methodology? You have to have order from chaos. You have to have a valid methodology where you can have the messy archaeology of the community, but it works at a, shall we say, a, a higher professional level than our standards. Recently, uh, I had projects in East Lothian which allowed the public to be involved at any level that they felt comfortable with, whether it was researching in uh, an archives centre, digging holes until they were told to stop, recording, or just actually sitting in the trench chatting, which was superb. There was one of my favourite episodes was um, an alcoholic from a, shall we say, a rather um, lower end of the, the town talking to an alcoholic from the upper end of the town, and they had a fabulous time. They understood, I don't understand a word they said, but they, they had a common goal. They had the archaeology and the trench to talk about. It was very much like that, um, the, uh, anyway, it was very dry at the time. <laughs> the opportunity, however, is for you to work at a tactical level on the site, but at a strategic level overall. That's up, up to us to act almost invisibly. We have to then look at how we record. And again, I'm back to our messy archaeology, hundreds of people. At this site alone, we had 300 children over a 10-day period. We had 150 adults of varying abilities. We had, I think, 10 students, I'm trying to remember. Um, and a few professionals as well. It didn't matter because we were able to turn this messy archaeology into recording it in chunks, moving people out of the way, recording it in chunks. So it allowed us to record a 19th century wash house. It's unbreakable archaeology, but it was actually telling a story of having to which they didn't know before. And because of this, it spiraled into then looking at 15th century bullet holes, sorry, 16th century bullet holes and looking at a, a medieval bridge. It's spiraling, it's getting the community involved in creating um, new knowledge which fits into the overall research agenda. This is where it's up to us to actually create the collation of the, the record and the access and the dissemination, which is absolutely crucial. There's no point in us doing what we do, whether it's commercial, academic or community if we don't tell people about what we are doing. That's why I'm glad this is online just now, so that more and more people can see what we are doing, what we think. And at the end of the day, it's all about creating these tiny pieces of information. We're up in Scotland just now, and uh, there's a guy called Tam Ward with the bigger archaeology group. What a brilliant group. A, an amateur group, a community group, who found the earliest evidence of humans in Scotland. This wasn't a commercial, it wasn't an academic, it was an amateur group who then disseminated and created a fabulous report about this, I think it's 17,000 year old um, uh, transitory camp uh, in, uh, is it Lanarkshire? I'm trying to remember now. I should read the report. It is <laughs> <laughs> the point is, that they had created another piece of the puzzle. It's not a case of we had to tell them what to do. They went out there and did it, and they did it in an organized way. And that's, as I say, the important thing is the methodology. Just before I stop, as I say, I'm trying to move fast, and I've completely lost it there. Just before I left, I found this um, little news report, and it, it cheered my heart again, because this is what it's all about, and you've got to excuse me while I put on um, ladies' glasses. And it was about a, a local amateur 
archaeologists, here we are, local amateur archaeologists made the discovery of a Bronze Age fire pit dating four and a half thousand years. The Chlamydian Range Archaeology Group uh, discovered it uh, on an Iron Age hill fort. They carried out excavations, it was a burnt mound, and this is the important thing the excavation was undertaken by them, supported by students, and the Clifford House Archaeological Trust. So that is all people gathering together for a single goal with an organized methodology which produces new evidence. So at the end of the day, as long as the community of public archaeology has some benefit, and it doesn't matter if it's a single brick that's been found, then it is a valid research project. Thank you very much.